Good morning. On behalf of the session and pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Clark Summit, I welcome you to this service of worship, whether you are here with us in the sanctuary or watching on YouTube or Facebook Live in the comfort of your home. My name is Jim Thiron. It is a privilege to fill in today for Bill Carter as he winds up a well-earned vacation. I'm a recently retired Presbyterian minister who, along with my wife Jan, have found a post-retirement home in the Endless Mountains and a spiritual home here with this congregation. You can learn more about this active and faithful church by going on the internet to fpccs.org. And for now, let us begin to prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the music of our prelude. Please join me in the call to worship. God meets us in our greatest need. In gratitude, let us worship the Lord our God.
Let us confess our sins in the presence of the one who blesses us and meets our needs. God of compassion, we are sick. We have wrestled all night with worry instead of resting in you. We have asserted our own goodness instead of awakening to yours. We have turned away those hungry for your help instead of trusting you and feeding them from your limitless supply of blessings. Forgive us, heal us, and help us to hold on to you. We call upon you, for you will answer us, O oh God. The God of steadfast love is our refuge and savior. In Christ, we who are broken are healed, forgiven, filled, and transformed. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Let us pray. All-knowing God, you have satisfied our hunger at sunset and held us close through nights of wrestling. Now let the day break with your blessing. Awaken and illumine us by your word that we may behold your likeness. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven, excuse me, and he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves. All ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full, and those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Today we continue the summer's series of sermons drawn from the book of Psalms. And today we turn our attention to Psalm 17, the lament of an individual calling on God to hear and act upon his prayer. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who take refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their mouths to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They track me down, now they surround me. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground. They are like a lion eager to tear, like a young lion lurking in ambush. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. By your sword, deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals. By your hand, O Lord, from mortals whose portion is life in this world. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good things come in threes. Or is it bad things? Or is it debts? Seems to me I've heard all three once upon a time. The number three and words related to it, like triple, occupy a special place in the vocabulary of our land. Why, just within the last, couple, last week, people have been relieved to hear once again the familiar phrases uttered by a sportscaster. We're in the bottom of the third. The bases are loaded. The count is three and two. The pitcher had hoped for three up and three down, but now he needs a third strike to get the batter out or a triple play to end the inning. In his novel, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, Stephen King has his little girl lost in the woods anticipate that the third ghoulish figure she has imagined will step forward to speak to her. These things, King wrote, had a certain form to them after all. Three wishes, three trips up the beanstalk, three sisters, three chances to guess the evil dwarf's name. King is on to something. Think about it. The big bad wolf was terrorized three little pigs. The farmer's wife chased three blind mice. The three musk musketeers were one for all and all for one, but the winner by a long shot is Goldilocks, who not only had three bears, but three chairs, three beds, three bowls of porridge, because presumably she was once, twice, three times a lady. And on it goes. Their three's company, three's a crowd, but you better not be the third wheel. Winning one horse race is not sufficient. You have to strive for the triple crown. At Manning's, only the fastest liquor can get down a triple scoop ice cream cone before it melts, especially on the 90 degree days we've experienced recently, which probably had some folks longing for a three dog night. Social distancing this summer has limited the opportunities for everyone's favorite punny uncle to observe that the count of the three bean salad has been underestimated. Following tradition this morning, our worship service includes three hymns and by chance two of them are in three quarter time. 
And after we sing the second one, we'll join together in stating what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, which features statements highlighting the three persons of the Trinity, which is sometimes symbolized by a triangle. We may not have sung holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed Trinity, but when we are all done here, we will leave this place to do God's work in the world, surrounded by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a method to my triple strength madness today. You see, one of the first things I noticed about Psalm 17 is that its author is fond of saying things three times in three different ways. And on top of that, the psalm falls into three parts, each of which includes a request and supporting words to back it up. The psalmist is praying in triplicate. As we overhear these thrice repeated requests, we learn something about the writer's relationship with God, something about the circumstances in which the prayer was prayed, and a lot about how we might lift our own prayers. When something threatens to keep you up at night, take it to the Lord in prayer and go for the three-peat. In the preface to his classic book on Psalms, Out of the Depths, my seminary advisor long ago, Bernard Anderson, wrote, the book of Psalms has a unique place in the Christian Bible. One reason for its singular role, as noted by Athanasius and outstanding Christian leader of the fourth century, is that most scriptures speaks to us while the Psalms speak for us. Psalm 17 is the first Psalm in the collection to have a heading which labels it as a prayer. When we read it, we pray it. When we pray it, it speaks for us by giving us words to use. We learn to pray by praying the prayers of others. Now I lay me down to sleep, our Father who art in heaven. The Psalms as the prayer book of the Bible provide us with plenty of words to use. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Now Psalm 17 may not be on the top of the list of the most familiar or memorized, but it has plenty to offer us. The circumstances of our praying may be different from those of the author who is identified as David, but the urgency of the situation is familiar to us, and the depth of the relationship with God portrayed is a possibility for us, and the assurance that eventually overcomes the anxiety is offered to us. The psalm begins with a trio of phrases calling on God to pay attention to the claims made by the author. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. The plaintiff, using legal language echoing passages in the Torah, then doubles down asking God to serve as judge. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. Eugene Peterson, in his translation, The Message, brings the same petition in words anyone in Judge Judy's court can understand. Listen while I build my case, God, the most honest prayer you'll ever hear. Show the world I'm innocent. You know in your heart I am. To bolster his case, the accused produces from his life three exhibits of evidence. And just for emphasis, he does this a second time. First, he invites God to give him the third degree. If you try my heart, if you visit me in the night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. Then he asks God to take a closer look. Pull up the GPS tracker and see where I've been. Take note that I'm usually a Psalm 1 kind of guy, all happy and blessed. By the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. Here, before we go any further, we 
must pause for a moment to question whether or not this guy is just too good to be true. Is this a person who legitimately could sit out the prayer of confession every week? We have a right to be skeptical. As one scholar puts it, a prayer made on the basis of one's own righteousness and integrity poses a serious question. How can anyone possibly ground prayer on such a basis with honesty? The words of Psalm 130 seem more in keeping with the reality that we know. Peter's, Peterson's translation goes like this. If you, God, kept record of wrongdoings, who could stand a chance? So what's up with this dude? The consensus is that he's not making a claim of a perfect life and a sinless record, deserving a commendation in the conduct portion of his report card. No, this prayer is in reference to a specific set of circumstances, which one commentator sums up this way. The psalmist is clearly in a difficult situation, falsely accused of some crime and physically threatened. Owing to his comment about the prayer being spoken by lips free of deceit and later descriptions of his adversaries, we are able to picture someone who has been charged by others whose words are not trustworthy and true. The writer has been wronged and looks to God to make it right. In contemporary terms, the psalmist is like someone who is indignant when accused of being a liberal because they will not, they're wearing a mask. This is the prayer of the college professor detained while walking to lunch because his hat and coat and skin color match the description of a robbery suspect. This psalm gives us words to use whenever we are labeled or libeled by those who play fast and loose with the truth. As the psalmist begins his second call for God to get busy, we get a clearer picture of the relationship between the psalmist and God. They have a history. The threefold call to be heard includes a note of confidence based on past performance, not just in his own life, but in the sweep of Israel's history. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words, Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who take refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. In addition to whatever personal experience the writer has of God's help in ages past, he's got Israel's history to base his confidence upon. Hinting at what God has done for Israel, the psalmist is saying, remember who you are. Remember what you do. Do it now for me. Show me a little of that steadfast love you're known for. And then to further jog God's memory and encourage God to act on his behalf, the writer draws upon a pair of image-laden phrases from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, which originally spoke of God's care for the people in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. The images are tender and tough, and speak of an intimate relationship. Guard me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. To be the apple of someone's eye is to be treasured. To be hidden in the shadow of an adult bird's wings is to be protected and cared for. When I'm out on a Pennsylvania pond in my kayak in spring, I often see these images played out right before my eyes. A mother mallard herds her little ones into the rushes, using her body as a barrier. A Canada goose hunkers down low on a hummock, spreading her wings over the just-hatched goslings nesting underneath. Noting how God has treasured and cared for Israel in the past, the writer asks for the same grace and favor in the present. And this is a familiar pattern in the Psalms. The one praying recalls what God has done, recounts the story before God, reminding them both, and then calls for it to be done again. It is a pattern 
to keep in mind and put to work whenever we approach God in prayer. It requires that we know the stories of what God has done for us and for others. It involves doing what we can to maintain the relationship and keep communication open. It means thinking through what we are asking and why. The psalmist knew why he was asking for God's help. The request to be guarded and hidden is supported by a description of his adversaries. Their approach to life stands in stark contrast to the one who is praying. Their behavior is eerily similar to much of what has, we have been witness to over the past few months of shouting about not wearing masks, assumptions about who won't go back to work, proclamations of who is responsible for transforming peaceful protests into violent confrontations. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths, they speak arrogantly. They track me down. Now they surround me. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground. They are like a lion eager to tear, like a lion lurking in ambush. This threat posed by such adversaries leads the psalmist to a third and final restatement of the cry for help. The volume is increased. The request is stated with laser-like precision. Beginning with the phrase, rise up, O Lord, which Israel used repeatedly to call upon God to act, the psalmist once more submits his prayer in triplicate. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. By your sword, deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals by your hand, O Lord, from mortals whose portion is life in this world. Of that final petition, one scholar writes, the appeal for God to rise up is a typical prayer for the Psalter. It is an appeal for God to act decisively, to be moved to action on the basis of what God has heard in the appeal. And what is important to notice here is that the author of the psalm leaves it up to God. He doesn't ask for permission to respond in kind or to strike back. And then come words which are open to interpretation, the words that support the third petition. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. Now one commentator hears them as evidence that the psalmist has lost all control of emotions. It's a final venting, asking God to give the advers adversaries what they deserve, some mysterious food stored up for future retribution. Others, however, hear those words as a request, request that those treasured by God might receive his providential care along with their children and their children's children. Either way, when the third petition winds down, the psalmist quiets down. The tone suddenly changes. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. Owing to the mention of waking up satisfied, Psalm 17 has been taken as a nighttime prayer. In the traditions that observe a daily cycle of prayers, it is the prayer compline at night. Nearly exhausted after his three-pronged petitions, the psalm, seem, psalm seemingly ends with the speaker closing his eyes, ready to fall asleep, now thinking of God's great faithfulness and the hope it brings for every tomorrow. Having taken his trials to the Lord in prayer, he's not going to go to sleep angry. Then, as one scholar notes, the final verse of the psalm imagines the psalmist waking up in the morning satisfied, not necessarily because all problems have been solved and enemies subdued, but because I shall behold your face in righteousness. 
God's presence is named as the reason joy comes with the dawn, even though it is likely that trouble still awaits. Having presented his petitions three times, having expressed confidence that his case has been given a hearing, having let it all go, leaving it up to God, the psalmist rests. Centuries later, Jesus used a memorable phrase to sum up what calmed and quieted this psalmist's soul. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And one way to trace the movement that the psalmist makes from panic to peace, from being agitated to being restful, come in a series of observations that appear from time to time on the internet. The pessimist sees the glass as half empty. The optimist sees the glass as half full. The realist knows the glass can be refilled. And then the psalmist. The psalmist provides the addition that allows for slumber in peace. For the psalmist, on one of his better days, having recalled who God is and how God cares for us, spoke of the one who refills the glass when he said, my cup overflows. Amen. Let us together state what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our response to God's abundance takes many forms. The leadership of this congregation are grateful for the many ways people continue to support the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church through gifts put into the offering plate by the door, sent through the U.S. mail, or given electronically at fpccs.org. We look forward to your continued faithfulness and cherish the stories of giving in Christ's name that are occurring day in and day out during these different days. Sharing the gifts you harvest from the garden, looking in on the neighbor whose family lives far away, doing all you can and encourage, uh, encouraging others to live responsibly one day at a time. So let us contemplate our gifts and our giving as we listen to the offertory. Let us pray. Life-changing God, you have touched us and transformed us to reach out to all who hunger and thirst for what only you can give. Keep our feet on your paths. 
and bless us to multiply blessings to others. Give us strength for our days and rest for our nights. Whether we lift our voices in praise, spit out our pain accompanied by tears, or silently let your spirit speak what we cannot put into words. Compassionate God, you are good to all. Help us to trust in you and to share what we have with a hungry world near and far. Open closed hearts to see and respond to those whose livelihoods remain on hold, whose savings are spent, whose hope dims with each delay of relief. We pray for the church universal, fractured by divisions of interpretation and practice, where our witness has been undermined by conformity to the world, inspire repentance and grant restoration so that amid the torrent of arrogant speech, our lips may speak the truth, point the way, and lead to life. We pray for all who are in positions of leadership, who face the difficult decisions brought about by the virus. Give them wisdom to sort through conflicting claims to find best practices and workable solutions that benefit all and not just some. We pray for all those who suffer from physical ills, especially those who battle the virus let loose in their bodies. We pray for those who wrestle with you for personal identity and spiritual peace. We pray for all who imperil their own health in order to care for others. And we pray for those we now name whose needs are already known to you. For Hall, for Lauren Loftus, for the Sladika family, for Grover, the Northrop family, Kim and Dawn and Kristen, Kyle, Christian, Megan, Diane, Grayson, Lexi Caviston and family, Albert, Dustin, Colleen, and Eddie, Dee, Betsy and her family, Shirley and her family, Kristen and Jean, Dustin, Ben, and Eddie, Jim and Sandy, Rachel, Dustin, Ben, Ruth Richards, Michael Lane and family, Linda, the Brown and the Orovic families, the Ryan family. O Lord, attend to our cries, give ear to our prayers, wondrously show us your steadfast love, that we may behold your face in righteousness and be satisfied when we awake. Beholding your likeness through Christ our Lord, in whom we have seen you, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Go now holding fast to God's path, knowing that you are lifted up by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the Holy Spirit communion of the Holy Spirit. Go now knowing that you are the apple of God's eye, that you are offered shelter under protective wings, and as you make your way, rest easy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.